so just to introduce ourselves a little bit more, um, for those who don't know us, Kobe and I are both theoretical computer scientists um, with collectively background in cryptography, differential privacy, and game theory. And we have been working, as Mac mentioned, for some time on the issues related to data, um, and in particular, privacy and fairness in computation. And for the past few, or few is not so few at this point, uh, years we've been thinking in particular about the e data ecosystem more as a, as a whole system and thinking about its strengths, its weaknesses, and um, what we might need to do to address some of those concerns. Um, and so today what we're gonna be doing is telling you a bit about our perception of where the problems lie, where the work uh, is to be done and some of our ideas about how maybe we might be able to revise the data ecosystem to make some improvements. Um, so this, this is a project that's joint uh, between me and Kobe and also our colleagues, um, Elizabeth Edinburgh at CUNY, Benny Pincus at Barilan and Alex Wood at Harvard. This is a, an intentionally highly interdisciplinary group, including computer scientists, a legal scholar and ethicist and a, a growing group. Um, so, so thank you to all of them also. So as you all are aware, uh, a complex data ecosystem has been sprouting up over the past couple of decades and data has really done amazing things. It's fueled innovations in so many aspects of our lives, enabling us to have experiences and get access to services that we really hardly could have dreamed of a couple of decades ago. But Along the way, uh, data has really turned into something new. It's become a multi-billion dollar business. And in fact, in 2017, there was an article in The Economist that confirmed it. Yes, data had become the world's most valuable resource beating out oil. And we've probably all seen versions of this slide illustrating the data ecosystem. Um, I don't even know actually which year this one's from, but it gets more complex and more dense with every passing year. Basically, the ways in which personal data are gathered, stored, processed, and used as the basis of a wide variety of decisions and actions is complex, even for the experts. And any summary of the data ecosystem is guaranteed to lose a lot of details. And we're going to take that to an extreme here with the cartoon of the data ecosystem that we'll use as the running illustration for today's talk. So here's the cartoon. And for today's talk, I'm going to pair the data ecosystem down to this very simple caricature. So let me first tell you what we mean by this caricature, and then we'll take a little tour of some of the sort of more disturbing effects and risks that the system entails. Um, after that, we'll look at a number of ways in which recent innovations could be deployed to revise this ecosystem and which pieces of the problem they really could potentially help solve. And what we'll see, spoiler alert, is that although there's some real exciting innovations in this space, there's some gaping holes that remain. And I hope you'll take this as a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work to be done in this space. Okay, so what's this cartoon? So the piece of the data ecosystem that I'm focusing on here, it's a system where lots of data about lots of people is being gathered in order to surface correlations, trends, patterns, even causal effects. And those global observations so that's sort of sucking up all the data on the left-hand side from all those people. Those global observations are then deployed in the service of personalizing the experiences of future individuals. And those individuals will receive personalized recommendations, different opportunities, tailored prices, basically some sort of personalized worldview. So there on the left-hand side, that's where we get the global information gathering where the companies are collecting every little detail about you that they can down to the split second of where your attention's going, where you're physically going, who you're interacting with, what you're buying, you name it. And that data is used in providing ever more refined personalization prediction sort of recommendation algorithms. So there on the right hand side, we see the deployment of such an algorithm um, on the data of a new user in order, for example, to offer them a job opportunity or a news item, a brand of toothpaste, a mortgage, a life partner. So in order to better understand this ecosystem, it's worth asking ourselves, why? Why is it structured this way? Why do companies care about giving you good recommendations? Or more sort of fundamentally, why are these entities sucking up tons of personal information about all of us? And there are a number of answers to that why question. 
One is these companies are using all of that data to improve their services, which gives them a competitive edge. Why is that good for them? Well, so they can make more money off of you by showing you more ads. Sometimes so that you'll pay for their service, but mostly so they can show you ads. And those better recommendations also make you spend more time on their service so they can show you more ads. And many of those recommendations are themselves really just ads. And they wanna show you the best ads that they can, the ones that make the most money off of you. Another reason potentially is that companies have just seen historically that data is really useful. Maybe they don't know exactly what they're gonna do with all of it yet, but it's an investment in the future stockpile and hopefully you'll be able to use it at some point. For what? To make money? How? Probably by showing you more ads since that's what they know how to do. So the bottom line is this infrastructure has evolved sort of as a finely tuned machine for capturing as much of your time, your attention, and your money as possible. And the internet has gotten good at reading your mind and anticipating your every need, not because anybody is trying to serve your interests, but because doing so is a powerful money maker. So data has evolved into something new in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And over a period of uh, these years, we got used to the fact that our details, personal data can be aggregated and mined for the creation of commercial value. And with our IoT devices and wearables and apps on our phones, we've moved to a continuous anytime, anywhere collection of data and very fine grade grained commercial surveillance. And furthermore, the personal data became so rich and it is challenging the notion, the notion of their own ownership. We can no longer pretend that my data is mine and that it is relevant only or even primarily to me. And there are some examples, for instance, uh, the simplest examples are like photos that I shared on Facebook but had other people in it. Uh, more uh, sophisticated data would be my genomic data that is also relevant to my cousin, my sister, my tribe. My contacts are also about them, not only about me. And then uh, there's the less obvious reality that this data ecosystem that we've built uh, is tailor-made to draw sweeping inferences. So my data, the collective data, and uh, plays a part in drawing inferences and predictions about you. And that is essential to the ecosystem. The side effect is that the multi-billion dollar industry has come to rely on building rich profiles of each of us that are continuously assembled and updated, including not only our browsing behavior and shopping habits, but also social relationships, health, sexual preferences, finances, mental health, religious beliefs, political orientation, you just name it. And this gives a handful of entities who control these rich stores of data a lot of power. But nobody elected these few entities uh, to these roles of power, and they do not reflect the diversity of humanity and of our culture. They don't necessarily have our best interests at heart, and we do not participate in their design and in their governance. Meanwhile, the fact that our data is siloed away in the hands of a few means that we are unable to unlock its full potential to benefit society in research and in other ways. And although we habitually talk about personal data, the reality is that your data possesses risks not only just to you, but also to other people, those who are close to you, and, but also people that you've never met and to society as a whole. So back to this cartoon, beyond the, the concentration and siloing of the data, of, of the power and the right to decide how data is deployed, uh, we can go wrong with, uh, with the ecosystem. And, and there are several ways in which is, this uh, uh, can happen. In recent years, we've seen a fair amount of attention being given to things that can go wrong uh, due to all this widespread data gathering. Uh, the black arrows on the left uh, uh, scope data uh, from all of us uh, all the time. And to a certain extent, this little orange uh, uh, arrow here, okay, is also gathering data from us in order to issue recommendations on the right uh, side of the slide. 
So we're going to use the metaphor that we find useful when we speak about this, uh, use of the data, about the risks of the data. And we're going to distinguish between uh, harms that originate information coming from us, and we call that the outgoing edge, and the risks that originate from information and services that are provided to us, that are tailored to our profile, and we call these uh, the incoming edge. So why, this is a metaphor that we'll use throughout uh, the presentation. So let me begin with the outgoing edge. This is uh, the kind of risk that have been traditionally uh, addressed uh, for many years. Uh, we, know, uh, we know a lot about this kind of risks. Uh, these include um, uh, risks because of data that is learned or information that is learned about us. This includes embarrassment and increased insurance premium, uh, loss of accesses to services, or loss of rights to, to uh, mobility, rejection of a job application, blackmail, coercion, arrest, bodily harm, and whatnot. And their harms, of course, affect only not only the person directly, but they also generate toxic effects of living in a society in which these risks, risks uh, hang over uh, people. Because the data uh, goes, because where our data goes once it enters the ecosystem is so opaque, in, in some sense, it doesn't matter how much you trust the company you initially engage with. The harms and risks accumulate as your data and its derivatives spread through the ecosystem in various forms into the hands of dozens and hundreds of entities you've never even heard of and with whom you have not established a formal relationship. Often we learn about these companies only when we get a data breach notice about my data being stolen from a company I didn't even know I had a relationship with. And so it's natural that we see a lot of work, both technological and legal work, going into reducing and mitigating these outgoing edge harms. We'll go into more detail in a moment, but this is where you'll hear a lot of the words like privacy, control, uh, retention policies, data deletion, and, and, and others. It's worth observing as well that we see the potential for amplified harms along the outgoing edge to those in already disadvantaged groups. And there's also the reality that surveillance tends to have a chilling effect on free speech, political organization, and generally makes for a pretty creepy reality. So in a sequence of slides, we'll ask what are data risks for the outgoing edge are necessary and remind ourselves with some of the technologies that can help mitigate them. We do not mean to say that these technologies completely solve the problem, they do not. Furthermore, we need to be aware that these technologies may already have some hardwired biases as their development was influenced by the needs of the current ecosystem. So the first technology I'll uh, mention here is secure multi-party computation. It can help eliminate the need of individuals to share information in any form of centralized, uh, yeah, in any form of centralized data gathering and computation. It allows us to replace trust in one party or a few parties by trust that sufficiently many parties are trustworthy. But alone, secure multi-party computation does not solve the problem. First, if a functionality that we compute leaks sensitive information about individuals, then also its secure multi-party computation implementation would leak the same information. And similarly, if it has other undesirable effects such as discrimination against the minority group. And the centralization of the computation alone does not give individuals negotiation power into what this computation should be and how it should be formed. And the centralization alone does not expand the set of socially beneficial computations that can be performed on the data. The second technology I mentioned is differential privacy. Differential privacy is actually a definition of privacy, which provides a framework for designing analysis that, uh, such that the outcome of this analysis does not reveal specific individual information. That is information that uh, is learned about the, in the, in the, about the individuals because of their participation and could not be learned about them if they did not participate. 
Uh, there are several ways to implement differential privacy or differentially private computations, and, and all are involved with the introduction of statistical noise. In one approach here, uh, this is called the local model of differential privacy. Each individual randomizes their information at the time of collection. So the privacy is preserved even if this noisy information is leaked. In another approach, uh, we trust the computation and noise is added in the computation itself. In all cases, and the use of differential privacy, uh, differential private computation implies some loss of accuracy in the outcome of the computation. And the challenge that designers of differentially private algorithms have is to minimize this noise while still satisfying the requirements of the definition. But then, by now we have a rich study of this concept and it yielded algorithms which are now in use by industry and also by government agencies. Next, we have a number of technologies that can help provide individualized uh, recommendation without having to reveal your uh, individualized data. Okay, that is a recommendation algorithm can be put on your phone or, or any other machine device that you have and provide personalized recommendations without having to send the individuals, uh, your individual information to the platform. And some relevant technologies include uh, uh, strong cryptographic tools and secure hardware. We're also seeing innovations in the legal space, including new regulations in Europe and the US, namely in California, and much of the legal tools are in form of a toolkit for controlling the flow of data. For instance, we have tools for describing which information can be collected and under what restrictions, uh, providing individuals with some limited transparency as to which data about them is being collected, formalizing data obligations, and how the, uh, they pass from one entity to another as there are passes uh, between these entities limiting of data retention and so on. And ideally we can think about legal tools for some other stuff, for instance, to impose more detailed restrictions on how and when data can be shared or require the use of algorithms satisfying fairness or privacy requirements. However, we see a very large gaps between the language that appears in legal requirements and that the, uh, the language that appears in uh, technical requirements. And this leaves many gray areas and loopholes. This calls for work uh, into bridging between this uh, diverging language. And yesterday we had talked by Sarah and by Aloni about two such attempts. So we have an impressive suite of new legal and te technical tools, but they don't solve the problems with the data ec ecosystem. Remember the caricature of the data ecosystem. Companies aren't looking over our shoulders and enabling others to do so just because they have heuristic tendencies. And they're doing it to make money. And this is done by capturing our attention better, by knowing us and our interests better, by shaping our behavior. And here on the incoming edge, where our collective data is deployed in order to enable more nuanced personalization, but are no less concerning, uh, sorry, there are harms that tend to get less attention, but are no less concerning. None of the technologies we've just surveyed puts restriction on the, in, in, on the incoming edge. Neither the legal tools nor the tech tools that we've mentioned so far are in a position to intervene to provide protection from discrimination or manipulation. Because of the financial incentives, platforms with the data power are growing into extremely sophisticated tools uh, uh, for shaping our thoughts, interests, desires, and actions. They influence how we spend our money, whom we date and marry, what we read and even our perceptions of reality. They've incred incredibly refined the ability to provide us with differentiated information, differentiated opportunities, experiences, prices and services based on our personal profiles. But another word for differentiation is discrimination and there is a huge opportunity here for manipulation. So surveillance and manipulation uh, are not just harms faced by individuals, but threats to democratic deliberation and to other aspects of our society. 
It's important to bear in mind that you can't protect yourself from this risk by withholding your data or controlling its flow. Inferences will still be drawn about you, potentially replicating all of these data harms, even if you did not initially contribute your data. The idea that the people around you and around the globe spill, in, spill is polluting your water too. And that's far from obvious. It's far from obvious that we should uh, that we should or can do with the tools that we have. So while this is only a caricature, it already captures a lot of the problems. So this uh, view of the data ecosystem highlights the fact that we still need more and better protection for the data that is, that is privacy, security, access control, usage limitation, retention policies, tools for data provenance, means for data deletions and more. But also an emerging view is that we also desperately need protection from the data to deal with surveillance, discrimination, fairness, political manipulation and social fragmentation. There's exciting emerging technical work on some of these problems, particularly on algorithmic fairness, but we need a lot more. The current tools being built are likely not on a trajectory to address the, social, the societal harms, uh, like erosion of trust in self or in others or in government or in science. And the troubling reality that a small number of tech companies get to decide on the social discourse and on profound societal issues such as what discrimination is acceptable, who is susceptible to manipulation and so on. So without uh, intending any harm, this community, uh, both the computer scientists and the legal uh, scholars carry some responsibility. So computer science has developed a technology that enables the current data ecosystem and too often maybe believing that it's value neutral. And happily, this is slowly changing. On the other hand, policy has allowed it to be used, this technology to be used, and has not adapted to the changing threats and the changing tools to address them. Moreover, to address this problem, it's absolutely needed that our different disciplines would develop tools which work together in a meaningful way. So at this point, at least to us, it's clear that it's time to seriously rethink the data ecosystem and that just leaving things as they are and deciding this problem's too hard, let's put it off for another year or 10 um, is a decision in itself. And it's probably not the one we wanna make. So what we'll talk about now is this new collaborative initiative um, with Elizabeth and Benny and Alex um, and other collaborators um, to start to map and address some of these underlying research challenges that, that we've started to identify here. So the central idea that a lot of our work has been exploring is the idea of introducing a new entity in the data ecosystem. And this entity, which we call a data co-op, would lie between individuals and anyone who wants to make use of their data. The idea is that individuals would elect to join a data co-op, and then the co-op would represent their interests in negotiations and transactions involving their data. And so this central entity, this new co-op, potentially stands in a position to intervene both on the outgoing edge and on the incoming edge. So for example, on the outgoing edge, that the co-op would be in a position potentially to control and minimize the flow of data. Um, the co-op would have potentially enough members that it would actually have some sort of political and economic power in the system. And the co-op would be in a position to negotiate for contracts that are more favorable to its members, conditions for how the data is used. The co-op would really be able to impose some of the technical tools and, and, uh, and some of the sort of new technical developments, which would be beneficial to individuals. So the co-op could insist on carrying out computations itself. It could insist on carrying out those computations subject to differential privacy or secure multi-party computation, so on and so forth. And the co-op itself could potentially be decentralized. Um, so you could think of a single co-op or you could think of some cluster of entities that together create some co-op infrastructure. On the incoming edge, um, the co-op 
would potentially be in a position to establish standards for what constitutes acceptable personalization, what's problematic manipulation. The co-op could potentially um, ensure that whatever the standards that it co its community demands or accepts are actually met. Um, and some of that could be by monitoring the services that are provided to its members. Some of that could be by actually providing the services itself. But this global view that it would potentially have of, of many people's data and many people's um, sort of services and worlds that are shaped by their data could potentially put it in a unique position to intervene there. Now, many of you are probably thinking that, hey, I've, I've heard something like this before. Kobe, if you can advance slide. Um, and yes, you're right, you probably have. Uh, the idea of introducing a new entity in the data ecosystem or an infomediary or a data co-op has been around for at least a couple of decades. Uh, the, the quote that I'll give you here is from this book, Net Worth by Hegel and Singer from 1999. So yes, quite some time ago. But the, a lot of the ideas there really sort of anticipated some of the main issues that we're seeing with the data ecosystem today. There's a lot that's really prescient in these mid 90s to early 2000s thinking and writing. There's a lot of, of course, that they, they didn't know was coming and they didn't have a lot of the same tools that we have today. But for example, this quote, as consumers begin to challenge marketers for control of their own customer information, they'll find themselves in need of a trusted third party to act as the custodian, agent, and broker of that information on their behalf, while at the same time protecting consumer privacy. So you see a lot already there in the 90s, um, for sort of anticipating what, what we see needed today. So why don't we already have data co-ops? Why aren't we all already members of data co-ops? It's not that nobody has tried. Um, as, as we view it, there have been sort of two main waves of attempts to bring something like this to fruition. Um, and actually for each of those, these waves, there's a nice paper that goes along with it, um, analyzing what went wrong in the waves. So for the first wave, which was sort of those late 90s, early 2000s, um, there's this nice master's thesis of Bethany Likely that lists some of the reasons for failure of those attempts. Um, and a lot of the, the reasoning there focuses on economic concerns, economic inviability of the model that people were pursuing, but also just the, the harsh reality of the dot-com crash, which cut short a lot of innovation um, at that time. We saw the second wave of attempts at various information intermediaries about a decade later. And there the paper to look to for analysis of what went wrong is this, is this nice paper of Narayanan et al. And one of the things that stands out to me there are a lot of the sort of technical challenges that were faced about a decade ago. And many of those issues, but not all of them are issues that are less salient today. And now in today's world, we're seeing a, what I would call a third wave of interest in infomediaries. And that takes many forms, but you see many, many, many groups uh, attempting in various ways to innovate in taking on various pieces of the problems of the data ecosystem. We tried to map the space of these innovations a couple of years ago and quickly found 30 something major projects. It's only exploded since then. Um, so there's a lot going on in this space today. So why should we have the audacity to suggest that this decade, the third time around, there's hope for data co-ops, really, third, third time's the charm. Well, well, one answer is that we have no choice but to try. The size of the problems of the data landscape have grown enormously, and simultaneously, luckily, public awareness is also starting to grow. And beyond that, as we saw in what Kobe covered in the talk, the past decade or two has seen the explosion of some really revolutionary innovations, both of a technical and of a legal nature, that can meaningf meaningfully really start to take on some of the pieces of the problem. And we just didn't have those technologies and those ideas before. That said, honestly, even with the most clever combination of these new innovations and others that we see out there on the horizon, 
we're not on track to address the severe harms of the current data ecosystem. It looks to us as if more fundamental change is needed and also really a new way of approaching these problems. And that's in some sense where this workshop comes in so beautifully. So the fundamental issues that come up when trying to address the problems of the data ecosystem really surface a large number of interesting and important research questions many of them just naturally spanning multiple traditional disciplines. I'll briefly mention a handful of them, uh, but this, this piece of the talk could go on and on for quite some time. So obviously there's plenty of work to do on the sort of more technical theoretical foundations, such as building new techniques to carry out crucial computations in a distributed and privacy preserving fashion, things like that. And there's interesting work to be done in designing technically how all the pieces and all the sort of different components might fit together. Uh, there's also really interesting questions that raised by thinking about restructuring the data ecosystem about uh, governance issues like how would a co-op's interactions with other entities be governed and how internally would a data cooperative potentially be governed. Um, given the enormous value of data, the billions of dollars we've been talking about, it's not surprising that co-ops also raise economic questions, including how do you set proper incentives for participants in a new data ecosystem and new techniques for understanding the value of data. And really some of the most exciting challenges lie in really explicitly bridging between the disciplines, building components that work together and aware are, are aware of each other's potentials and weaknesses that together can achieve their goals in the real world. Part of why we feel that data co-ops and these underlying problems need attention from academia is because this brand new potential entity introduces huge new risks and folks who are more oriented towards implementation and getting stuff done might not have the inclination or the luxury to deeply and constantly dig into those risks. But it feels absolutely essential to us to be constantly, continuously alert, hyper alert to the unintended consequences that any revision to the data ecosystem could have. Um, specifically in the data co-ops case, um, we have a long, long list of ways this could potentially go wrong. Um, for example, they could be potentially subject to existing threats like hacking, subpoena. Uh, if you didn't put sufficient controls in place, they could easily replicate existing data harms. Um, and also you have to think about how could co-ops turn bad over time and even questions like how they might amplify existing disparities in society. So how do you tackle a huge problem like this? Um, well, I can't say that I know the right way. Um, if any of you do, please tell me. Um, but I can sketch briefly what we're actually doing. Um, and basically that's attacking this problem quite deliberately simultaneously from multiple angles. And that's what we're trying to show here with this schema. So on the right hand side here, um, some of us on the team are really actively working on bits and pieces. I think of them as sort of modular Lego bricks that could form components of a solution. And simultaneously, we're taking a very top-down approach with work on establishing principles that a revision of the data ecosystem should uphold and doing things like trying to organize the problem space in various ways, such as this incoming outgoing edge analogy. Um, we're also intentionally working collaboratively across the disciplines. Um, our core team includes more theoretical and more applications oriented computer scientists, law scholars and ethicists, and we're actively expanding the set of experts who are involved in the work. Um, and what does that collaboration look like? Well, it's time intensive and we don't really know any other way. We, we meet, we talk, we explain, we debate, we try to understand each other, we try to understand each other's approaches, tools, assumptions, vocabularies. We watch talks together, we read together, we learn from each other. Uh, it's really fun. Um, it's also sometimes uncomfortable and periodically I look at Kobe and say, what are we doing here? Are we actually making any progress? We haven't proved any theorems. Um, but it's, it's overall really, really exciting and fun. And of course, we're simultaneously trying to keep a foot grounded in practice and awareness of the challenges that implementation will bring. Um, so for those of you, sorry, can you go back one more, Kobe? I'm not quite done with that. 
Thanks. Um, so for those of you who are looking for problems to work on, let me highlight the incoming edge. So there you have it, a rich source of the critically important issues that we currently deeply do not understand. We don't have the right language for talking about them. We don't have the right tools to address them. Questions like what constitutes acceptable personalization? What is manipulation? Who gets to decide this? How should they decide this? And once we somehow know what's acceptable, how can we make sure that the unacceptable stuff isn't happening? How can we detect it? How can we enforce it? Um, and these questions very naturally bring together both computer science technology and tech kinds of thinking, and also legal technology and, and legal types of thinking. And really these and many other questions await. Okay, you can advance now. So in summary, uh, the time is ripe for a rethinking of the data ecosystem. And we're really at a threshold of feasibility for many of the necessary components. That said, there is still a lot of work to be done. There are huge pitfalls to be avoided. Um, but at the same time, despite these risks, we really think this is a direction in which we must proceed. And clearly, critically, bridging between computer science and law is going to be absolutely essential to the success of this venture. Uh, so thank you again to the organizers. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in a place where this type of bridging is, is valued and growing. Thanks.